Where did they get their idea? I wonder. Could have been back in June 1971, and God knows how long they've had this engine. However, it's reality. We have symbiotic engines in aeronautics. We're moving into that area right now with the F-22 and beyond uh, with our future fighters. So, which is science fiction, which is science fact? Where does it start and end? You can't tell anymore. When we got back up to the surface uh, on the golf carts, um, there was another problem developing. I already knew that um, if they could hold this kind of information back, there's a lot of other things going to happen. I also knew my rocket was gone because I built it under a federal grant. They were going to take the rocket. Well, that bothered me enough, but the other problem was something they were talking about that while I was standing there being a, ch a child, they're not paying attention. And that's when I first heard the terms first strike. And I'm going, what is first strike? And then I started thinking about it. That's June 1971. We're in the throes of the Vietnam War. We're in the pitch battles. Um, wasn't long after me lying had occurred. We bombed the di just bombed the Dickens out of Cambodia uh, because the Soviets were supplying weapons to the north. We wanted to do s surgical nuclear strikes. General Westmoreland did. And the Soviets said, you fire one of those off and we'll go to global thermal nuclear war. The only reason we didn't attack each other was MAD, M-A-D, Mutual Assured Destruction. So the only way to win MAD is first strike. Whoever gets there first wins. My rocket engine out there went from zero to 8,654 miles an hour in 4.1 seconds. The fastest thing ever. So if you take that type of engine containment system and put it on nuclear warheads and put them on, a Soviet, on your own subs, park it off off of Siberia, the Soviets would never see but flashes of light, and that's it. They wouldn't even have time to move out of their chairs, no retaliation. So if you take out the Soviet Union, you wouldn't destroy the whole country. You would take out all the key military sites and the major cities, and they'd surrender. But if you do that, you'll have to hit another country same day called China. They have nuclear weapons, and they're not going to stand there and watch us take out the other superpower. So about a billion people are going to die in a single day. So I'm sitting there going, all because of my engine? Unbelievable. So I scooped up a hand of, um, full of graphite grease off of one, the hangar door there at the wheels and started crying. And I said, I want to see my rocket. So they thought, just a kid, take him out to see his rocket. I want to see what it at least looked like. So I uh, went out there with the two sergeants on the golf cart. We got out there. I walked over to it and opened the hatch, opened the, the uh, particle accelerators put the graphite grease, just smeared it on the doors inside and close it. When you turn on particle accelerators and the fuel is using deuterium, and any physicist what happens with deuterium meets graphite. It's um, pretty bad. It's a major reaction explosion. So I turned on the particle accelerators with no fuel involved, and I told the uh, two sergeants, it's got a fuel leak. We've got to run for it. So we get on a golf cart and take off. I gave it 60 seconds on a time delay. When you engage, it exploded. It blew a whole size of a football field out there. There's nothing left. Now they have no rocket. Now they have nothing to work with, but they got this, <laughs> this kid. So um, I was told I'm going nowhere for the rest of my life, and it was scary. They threw me in a room and kept me there for about 10 hours. And then um, a lot of noise in the outside. The door opens up, and there's this big egg. Um, Stogie chomping figure in the doorway, going like that, and his name is Curtis LeMay. So um, he came there and got me and took me all the way back home to Wright Patterson, and he took me back home to my parents. He told me that um, they're not going to be through with you, they'll deal with you again. And he was right. So that was the end of my summer vacation in um, my junior year in high school, how I spent my summer vacation. And um, What did he say to your parents? Well, my parent, uh, LeMay just told, he didn't say anything to my parents. He said he left it up to me. He just got me home. So it was quiet through the winter and the spring, and I'm graduating from high school. It's June 10th, 1972, and I'm ready to um, go to Ohio State. All of a sudden, um, I'm shaking hands in line, and I get hold of this one line, and I turn around, and I got hold of this guy's hand, and it is a DOD agent from Groom Lake right there in Centerburg, Ohio, and he slaps this paper in my hand. I read it. It says, greetings. I'm drafted. And um, 
they throw me in a car, my parents are hollering and um, nothing they can do because um, they're not property of the United States government. It's called conscription, buddy, and you're gone. So after about three hours, I'm back, um, well, I was on a plane, I was ended up at Langley, Virginia, home of the CIA and more fun activities. What they wanted was the engine to be rebuilt again. And um, we had to work out some compromises. I ended up spending 10 years in the Navy. Um, I never did build the engine again. That was the last thing Curtis LeMay told me to do, to never build another rocket as long as you live. You might make it out of here. And he was right. So um, instead, I agreed to build jet engines. So I was a jet engine designer, technician in the Navy, and um, worked on the Tomcat and the ETC Hawkeyes and other various aircrafts. And um, so it became an interesting career. After 10 years, I had enough of that, opened up a private consultant business, and I've been doing space technology transfer, where we transfer technology from space programming to commercial applications. I've been doing that for the last um, 17 years. So I can take you around the Earth eight times as fast as you blink your eyes. That's the capability of this type of propulsion. How, how is this type of How did you come about this type of propulsion? <laughs> oh, God. Well, yeah, this is not the place to bring that up, I guess. Dreams. Uh, it all came in dreams. All the mathematics, everything. I was working quantum physics when I was seven. I was born with it. Yeah. So now you know how all this stuff works. When I got to a certain point, though, the mathematics were too difficult to achieve. <clears throat> mainly because there was no computers available. I mean, the handheld calculators didn't come out 10 years later. You know, the only thing I've got, I have no fax, no modems, no email, no um, laptops, uh, floppy disks, hard drives, none of this stuff existed. You had a pencil, a piece of paper, and a slide ruler, and chalkboards <laughs> all over the buildings, and your brain. And born with photographic memory, I was able to contain great amounts of lot what we call algorithms. I met somebody else later that could help me with that when I was building this big rocket. I ran to the end of my mathematical capability, and um, my high school <laughs> science teacher came out to my lab where I was at work all the time. He looked at these writings. He borrowed some of them made photocopies and gave mine back, took the photocopies, went to Ohio State University. Everybody in the physics department looking at this going, where did you get Stephen Hawkins' work in his handwriting? Or, you know, it looks personal handwriting. And now it came from this 15-year-old kid building these rockets out in these cow fields. Like, <laughs> so they mailed the stuff to Cambridge, England. And, um, um, let's see, that was... In July 1970, I went to uh, Ohio State University with my science teacher. Uh, oh, July 1969. And um, this little frail guy was sitting in uh, one of the big academic uh, classrooms. And I walked in, I saw these equations on the walls, and I went, Who's messing with my work? You know, and they. Little guy stands up, indeed. I went, he says, it's his work. And I went, yeah, yeah, oh, I guess it is. Besides, it's not going to work down on that side anyhow, pointing to that part of the room on the chalkboard. And he goes, how so? I said, well, I'll walk over and you know, started racing it. Wait, you know, it works like this. So he looks at it and then he goes, how do you validate that? And I go, rocket engine. And he's looking at the equations, back to me, and he goes, um, how do you get all your information? I went, comes in dreams every night consecutively. So he drops his chalk, and he turns around, I figure, <laughs> end of conversation, good, I got, I'm busy, I need to go home anyhow. I start to head for a door, and he goes, wait a minute, he goes, um, he goes, we dream on the same wavelength, all my stuff comes to me in dreams, therefore we are brothers, have a seat. And his name was Stephen Hawkins.